You read the title right. I'll not stand for Korra slander. Anyone who says every part of Korra is awful is either lying or trying to sell you something. Speaking of selling you something, this video is sponsored by Campfire. Use my code and link to try the program designed by and for writers and world builders for free. Season 3 of Korra equals and surpasses The Last Airbender at times, with arguably Avatar's best antagonists, fight scenes, and a tightly written story that culminates in a powerful, evocative spectacle of an ending. Again, I'll ask for a Korra good in the comments. But no story is perfect, and this is all just a fun thought experiment, alright? So we've been rewriting it season by season, and we've already fixed seasons 1 and 2, and normally we'd have these rules, right? But I don't really want to change season 3, it's already amazing. So instead we're going to talk about what makes this season so great, and the 5 minor changes needed to fit it in with how we wrote seasons 1 and 2. So. Previously on Legend of Korra. After Amon took almost all of her bending away, Korra was left searching for a way to restore her powers. A water tribe civil war forced Korra to look into the past for help and answers, where she saw how people first learned bending from the original benders. Tenzin and his family find a hidden island of non-benders living alongside Sky Bison, and in the final moments of the season, a young child there begins to airbend. Change number one. The most important change, alright? Zakir keeps the beard. He doesn't shave his head. I get why they did it, alright? Yeah, I know, air nomad culture, blah blah blah, but come on, which would you pick for reasons? Zaheer and Ko are easily some of the best villains we've ever had in Avatar. They banter, they're funny, they're really human, and it's so cool to see someone with an amputation in a role like this with Ming Hua, who is voiced by the same actress as Azula, by the way. Zaheer being in love with Pali is another great touch. You genuinely feel kind of awful when she dies in episode 12. It is, for me, Avatar's one true ship. Pelia or Zapli, I don't know, what, what should it be? There's this real look of horror on Zaheer's face, one that only would have looked even better if he had a beard. What I love about these guys is that they have all of the traits we associate with that of a hero team, right? They work together, they complement each other's strengths, they negate each other's weaknesses, and if you really get down to it, the Red Lotus has some good points to make. You know, not like the, the, the murder points, but the other points. They don't feel like robots, but living, breathing humans, unlike Unalak from season two, or Vatu, who were just evil for the sake of being evil. Amon was also a really human and compelling and threatening villain, but the writing around Zaheer in season 3 is a lot better on average than in season 1, so it gives Zaheer a more potent role overall. One problem with writing villains is, of course, that you can't have them lose too much or they don't feel like a threat anymore. So I went through the series and I counted. There are roughly 10 fight scenes with Zaheer, of which he outright wins 6, even against people like Zuko, you know, the Fire Lord and all that, and he only loses 4, and the times that he does lose, he was nearly always in control of the scene anyway, like he tactically retreats. The exception to this is him versus Tenzin, a fully trained airbender, and him versus Korra in the Avatar state, which, you know, fair. I think if I went up against Korra in the Avatar state, I wouldn't do much better. Narratively, the Red Lotus repeatedly demonstrates how capable they are by besting all of our main characters at least once. And they're not just beating up, say, faceless goons. That's kind of a cheap way to demonstrate how dangerous your villain is. This is one reason why Azula always felt more like a threat than Zuko. You know, she repeatedly demonstrated herself against the heroes to be their equal or even more competent. Now, do I need to mention how season 3 has easily several of the best fight scenes, not just in Korra, but in Avatar as a whole? Tenzin vs. Zaheer is only surpassed, in my opinion, by the Agni Kai because there's so much more between Zuko and Azula, you know, in this emotional, relational way. The fight between Korra and Zaheer in the finale is, and here's what's really cool, designed to be a mirror of the Aang vs. Ozai fight in The Last Airbender. It's got these huge pillars of stone with an airbender fleeing the very embodiment of rage. The parallels contrast their characters, Aang and Korra, and it, better than any other moment in the series, exemplifies how determined and unshakable Korra is. She, at this point, is dying. There is mercury flowing through her veins, with some of the most powerful benders ever seen fighting her, and she still manages to best all of them. 
She will give up her life, but she will never give up letting the bad guy win. Across the series, we see how she learns to direct her anger, her self-righteousness, her power, which have been occasionally flaws in the past, into real strengths that come out in these moments. I think that it and she and the series is a complicated mess and I love it. One thing that people seem to complain about is that Korra doesn't grow, she doesn't change or learn, and that's just not true, not at all. Across season three, we see her learning self-control and learning the difference between anger and righteous anger. We see her recognize her flaws and learn to rely more on others, not do everything on her own by herself. We also see her refine her strengths. Raw power rarely gets her anywhere in this season. She has to learn to trust and stop thinking in ways that once upon a time meant people like Amon outsmarted her. She recklessly, if you'll remember, challenged Amon to a fight one-on-one -on -one the moment she could basically in season one. That's the sort of person she was at the beginning. But here, here, we see she waits and plans before stepping up to face Zaheer. And all of this change I think is really facilitated by these fantastic antagonists who prompt her to think and consider herself. Change number two, Korra Sami. Nickelodeon were naturally terrified of letting Korra and Asami get together on screen because it would immediately turn every single child who watched the show into a lesbian. We're gonna change that. Season three is gonna be a lot more Korra and Asami centric. Now, in our rewrite, she was originally an equalist before turning to help keep the peace in Republic City. So at this point, she and Korra respect each other, but it's more of an alliance than a friendship. So this season, we want that to be Korra and Asami becoming real friends. Korra is allowed back into Republic City, just like she is in episode one, to fix the spirit vines. And we're gonna see Asami and Maya Korra as she helps the spirits resettle in a new location outside the city with the promise that they will plant a spirit tree in a grove in the middle of the city park. They'll take care of it, a pact similar to the one that she saw with the Southern Water Tribe last season. And as they look out over the spirit's new home, Korra will say something like, you know, everyone keeps telling me that the avatar needs to be this, or can't be that, but I think, I think this is what I was meant to be. Asami says, it's beautiful, and most of the world just sees it as inconvenient, you know. I heard some spirits have taken up living in the catacombs under Ba Sing Se, but um, I suppose this is us, we, we both have places to be. Korra says, yeah, I do, but we can take a moment longer. When she's frustrated, she's gonna turn more and more to Asami, this other person who has so much anger and rage at trying to find their place in the world and trying to help, but not necessarily knowing how to, right? And so she's going to find that empathy in this person she didn't necessarily expect. And we actually see her turning more to Asami in the season anyway. You know, there's this episode where they're trapped in the desert and it's gonna be a bonding moment where they learn to really rely and trust and rely on each other. And it's gonna go beyond admiration and into mutual respect and that into friendship before Korra realizes that, um, you know what? She's kinda hot too. Just a little moment here or there, you know, with a dash of flirting. At the end of the series, when Zaheer demands Korra turn herself over to the Air Nomads, everyone is gonna be like, no, Korra, you can't do that, except Asami. And with Tenzin captured, and with Marco and Bolin not really listening to her, she's gonna confide in Asami again. I don't really know what Zaheer wants to do to me, but I can't keep running away just because other people are scared. I won't. And Asami says, I know you have to do this for yourself, and I know how strong you are too. I fought you. <laughs> do it. You'll find a way out. So that's really the crux of this arc. We gotta show one, mutual respect when they're dealing with spirit stuff in Republic City, two, show they can trust and rely on each other in the desert, and three, show Korra can be vulnerable with her fears and hopes at the end of the series. Plus a dash of flirting, as I said. They're not falling in love yet, but they are gonna come out of this trusting each other as friends. It's that story of people with very different backgrounds, both seeing issues in the world, wanting to help, but having to learn how to help. That's a very different thing. You know, where Asami is emotionally insecure, Korra is very sure of herself, and where Korra is very often impulsive, Asami is a lot more cautious, tending to plan ahead. We're gonna see them complement each other's strengths and negate each other's flaws, which is what we see in the villains as well. And these are gonna naturally come out in the story beats that are already in the series. Change number three, new airbenders. So in our rewrite, season three starts in virtually the same place, practically. The southern spirit portal has opened, the spirits are moving into the physical mortal world, and new airbenders have appeared. 
The only difference is the reason. It's still a magical moment in its own right, but it doesn't come from the vague magical space kite energy from space with planets. It's because Tenzin finds this group of people who we're gonna call the Bison Nation who have been living amongst Sky Bison, kind of learning their own spiritual and philosophical ways for generations. And this is actually kind of drawn from season two where we find this isolated tribe of people who are super spiritual living along Sky Bison. Uh, and we're taking that and just changing a little bit. It's not just genetics, and I think it reflects the deeper themes of the show better. Just like in the show, Tenzin is going to try and recruit these people to join his new air nomads, but most of them aren't gonna want to. I mean, they have their own lives, their own traditions, their own culture that they don't just wanna uproot. A new group of airbenders, you know, inspired to go and find out who they are, will even set sail with their newfound powers to go see Ba Sing save for themselves believing that they can make it on their own, that they want to see the world. That's when Tenzin will get wind that Zaheer has escaped, and the village elder's face will go dark at the mention of his name. Zaheer was one of our greatest spiritual leaders. He kept the histories like few others, but when he took a dark path, he was exiled. If he has developed airbending, as some of ours just have, then he will be extremely dangerous. So this explains Ahir's knowledge of the Air Nomads, his history, and it gives him more of a grounding in the story at hand. It's also how we're gonna meet Kai. And no, I wanna clarify, this doesn't mean that anyone can become a bender. So it's a common theme in fantasy for magical things like this, you know, older magics to fade as time goes on. Later on in the season, when Korra meets Iroh, you know, he's gonna explain to her that humanity has probably lost the ability to learn like that as they distance themselves from the spirits, from nature. It only happened with the airbenders because one, these guys have been living the spiritual lifestyle alongside Sky Bison for generations, and two, it's only happened to a handful of them, and three, airbending was always the most spiritually connected and so it was probably the one most likely to this happen to. Maybe it could happen elsewhere, but it would be so rare and difficult that it'd be dismissed as rumor or as someone who just already had bending, right? Only someone like Zaheer or the Avatar could do it. So Tenzin and Team Avatar spend time learning about this community, their ways of life, how similar they are to the nomads, even though they branched off a long time ago, but also that they're different. They have their own culture and they stay there on this island to keep Korra safe, to keep her secret while they learn exactly what's going on. And weeks later, Tenzin will get word that the other airbenders who left for Ba Sing Se have vanished. Team Avatar will go to investigate, just like they do in the show, and rescue them. Change four, Zaheer's philosophy. One more small thing to change is how the show represents anarchy. In episode nine, Zaheer gives Korra the spiel about how they need to overthrow tyrannical governments, you know? We've seen how Sozin's autocracy led to the Air Nomad genocide. Then there's the Earth Queen, who has the temperament of a 50-year-old woman drunk on the power of a shift manager at a supermarket. There was Unalak, who tried to do a colonialism, and he is right, but I don't think it quite articulates why the Red Lotus is doing what it's doing, or what anarchy really means, like philosophically. There's this line that he says, he says, the idea of having nations and governments is foolish. The natural order is disorder. But like, this isn't actually what anarchists believe. It's not that nations or governments are foolish or just dumb, right? But that the ones we don't consent to live under are. That the natural order isn't disorder, but it's whatever order people willingly choose to engage in. It's that idea of consent that they really care about. It feels a little bit like an infantile way of portraying anarchy, so I'd prefer he says something like, people are born into this world as slaves. Slaves to queens and fire lords and presidents, even avatars who decide their place in life for them. So to think the world would be better off if leaders like them were eliminated. True freedom can only be achieved when oppressive governments are torn down. Governments people did not choose for themselves, Power should be freely given, not taken by force of an army, or bureaucracy, or tradition. This also sets up why they want to kill the Avatar, which is never actually explicitly stated in the series, it's all subtext. Because the Avatar is given power and authority simply because of how they were born, not because people choose to give it up. It's kind of like power by tradition, by lineage. I love season three because it has the goal to explore these 
fascinating world building questions. Like it works really well with the overarching theme of Legend of Korra in this evolving, modernizing world with Korra trying to figure out what her place is in it and even the place of the Avatar. Like what does it mean to exercise power justly, to inherit authority? It interrogates the responsibilities she has in ways that we've never really seen and have real ramifications for how she approaches the problems in season four. This is why rescuing airbenders from the Earth Queen is also a really important plot point. Tenzin starts out trying to force people to join him because he says, you know, you have a duty, it's on your shoulders now. As an airbender, you should join me whether you want to or not. The Earth Queen's behavior forces Tenzin to confront that behavior and he says, you know, you are nobody's property. Your path forward is your own. In both circumstances, people were dictating the place of others without their consent. But Tenzin evolves in the show to show how air nomad culture is in this way, the archetypical and epitome of anarchic society, purely voluntary, and there's a beauty in that. Airbending isn't just the element of spiritual freedom and detachment, but the element of societal freedom, a political structure without the oppression that we see throughout the rest of the world. Change Cinco, Astral Projection. So this is a power Jinora has in season three. She gets it at the end of season two, but um, well, in our rewrite, we didn't do because it was terrible. So she never really got that power. This season is about air nomad culture, about rebuilding in the wake of genocide, about the different ways that can happen. Janora becoming a master at the end is a beautiful culmination of those themes because it's not just a celebration of her character, but it's the very visceral resurrection of the air nomad community. It only happens because she invents a new airbending move, the tornado we see in the finale, which requires a community of airbenders with a ceremony performed by that community in front of them. Astral projection plays a very small role in the actual plot, which can easily be worked around. So we're instead going to build up to it in this season, because I think it fits better in season three anyway. We're going to see Janora meditating several times across the series, helping Korra get into the spirit world. She's communing with the spirits, teaching the others air nomad ways. And we're gonna see hints of this ability, right? Glances outside her own body. And it's gonna culminate in the ultimatum, episode 12, when it's revealed that the new air nomads are actually being held in a hidden location somewhere else. Janora is going to be able to astral project to tell Korra and the others where they are being held and that they're being played, allowing Korra to break the truce like she does in the show. This does two things. One, I think it gives more of an arc to Janora because initially Tenzin refuses to let her get her full air nomad master tattoos. And two, it foreshadows Zaheer's new airbending ability, flight. Now, I personally really like these two new abilities. The moment where Zaheer loses Pali and then recites the old Air Nomad proverb, empty and become wind, is just fantastic. It totally makes sense within the series, and it's set up really well. He can finally let go of the one thing holding this man to the earth, his emotions and love, Pali. He can let go of them and it allows him to express airbending in this pure way. Likewise, astral projection really reflects the spiritual roots of airbending and keys really well into Tibetan cultural influences in the show. This is in contrast to spirit bending, which if you watch my season two video, you'll know that I actually didn't include. It felt cheap to me as a way to deal with spirits, like you just magically purify them, rather than actually trying to understand the spiritual relationship between the physical world, the spirits, and the mortals around them. It just didn't really align also with what I felt water bending was about or should be capable of. It also led on to the spirit lasers, which is a whole thing we'll get to in season four. But either way, this leaves us in relatively the same way. Well, Korra doesn't have access to uh, earthbending or firebending yet, she's still gonna get those back in the future, but she ends up after a fight with Zaheer in the finale, she ends up crippled, 
broken and exhausted with being the avatar. Now, I try to only take sponsors that I feel you guys will like, will be helpful, and you know what? You can go and check it out for yourself for free at my link down below if you want. Campfire is a writing and world building software designed for and by writers and world builders. It's got a word processor built into it, timelines, map building for D&D of your own fictional world, whole pages dedicated to magic systems and character profiles, which are just beautiful, by the way. So, can't keep track of your own world building? Bam, campfire. Need to plan out your My Little Pony erotic fanfic? Bam, campfire. Wrestling with the existential dread that everything you have ever loved will come to dust? Um, I don't know if campfire can help with that, but, um, but, but give it a shot. The thing that really stood out to me about campfire is that you only pay for what you want to use, right? If you want the map designing features, you only pay for that. I hate Adobe because they make you pay for everything, even though I only want two programs. Campfire doesn't do that. Campfire, good. Link below, stay nerdy, and I will see you for season four in the future. Thank <laughs> you.